life. Well, hello and welcome to the live stream of the the Car Kierna channel. Folks, we have revamped the live stream just for you. We've had a lot of issues with the live stream lately. It's been cutting out, doing all kinds of things. So you revamped the whole thing. I hope you like the new live stream. We're going to do a few things here and there for it. So before we get started with the live stream, if you're new to the channel, Welcome for our family gathering here at the Car Kierna family. If you would like to subscribe to the channel, check out some of my other videos, do that. If you are a return subscriber and a family member of the Car Kierna community, thank you so much for tuning into the live stream. And without further ado, let's roll light right into the live All right. Well, let's start with the questions, folks. Are you guys ready? Let's do this. So the first question is from Godfather. Does Toyota sell any suction cups for dents on my 2021 RAV4 has two dents on the roof? So Toyota officially does not sell that. This is something you want to go aftermarket and find something that works. You know, there's all kinds of types and whatnot. So, but officially Toyota does not have anything and the next question is, Corollas, should I use 91 or 93 octane fuel for my 2011 Lexus IS250, 120,000 miles? So you can use 91. If you have 93, you can use it as, as well. But 91 is sufficient. You should be good. You should have no issues. Superman, 2013 Venza has a vibration issue. I did record a video like you told me and commented, but I don't think you watched it. Unfortunately, sometimes the comments have been a lot lately. I'm trying my best with the comments. So I'm going to put your comment here. It vibrates at 900 RPM every time. I check the dog bone like you told me, and it has no cracks. With each downshift, the RPM spikes to around 900, 950 RPM. And I can feel three vibrations in a row coming through a stop, third gear, second gear, first gear. So the first thing you want to do is clean your throttle body, make sure that's taken care of. And the second thing you want to do is determine if this is normal. The 2GR has a vibration right at idle where it's, it's kind of like you feel the whole car just have a harmonic vibration. That is normal. And I, I don't want you to mistake that for something abnormal so if you have another car that has a 2gr make sure you check it out and see if that is indeed that vibration that i'm referring to so loco por toyota what maintenance do you recommend for vehicles only do frequent short trips i only drive my truck to take out the trash and each time it's two minutes down the street fuel additive helps so in your case you do want to uh potentially run an induction service because you are uh, driving low distances there. Try every week to take it on a longer drive and maybe, you know, a joy drive. Just just drive it down the street, maybe take it on the highway a little bit. That'll help it a lot because these short trips are really not good and make sure that oil change is done every six months. James Kyles, any tricks to changing the fuel filter on the 2004 Tundra? So... I am trying to remember if the 2004 Tundra has an external filter. If it does, which would be under under the hood on the passenger side. I'm trying to remember here off memory. I'm almost sure it does not have an external filter. This is a little bit older or something I don't see every day anymore. But if it doesn't have an external filter, which most likely it does not, you're going to have the filter in the fuel tank. So just drop the fuel tank. I don't really recommend you replace it. But... If you do want to, that's up to you, but I wouldn't replace it because it's not really a replaceable fuel filter. Another question is Lion Runner. Which would be more reliable, the one you are FE or the one GR FE? Should I worry about any the timing belt or the timing chain would be better? So the one you are 
is a timing chain. The 1GR is also a timing chain. You should not worry about either of them. If you are referring to a 1UZ, or sorry, a 2UZ, because I'm not sure which car we are talking about, if you have a 2UZ, that's a timing belt, but ever that's a V8, but the 1UR is a 4.6 V8, that does not have a timing belt, and I wouldn't worry about that chain at all. Another question you had was, do you think the full-time four-wheel drive would last longer or part-time four-wheel drive would be better? If full-time four-wheel drive would not last long as part-time four-wheel drive, is there anything I can do as a user maintenance-wise? So they both last the same thing. I wouldn't choose one over the other as long as you practice them. Granted, full-time four-wheel drive, you're going to have a better chance of having no issues because it's uh, it does it's always in all-wheel drive. You only have that low range, and if you engage it once a month, just engage into low range and come out of it two, three times, and you're good. But the ones that are part-time, you do want to engage that for high often, once a month at least. Just engage it, drive it for a little bit, shut it off, come at two, three times just to get things moving, and you these things will last a very long time like that. That's really, other than the differential service, I wouldn't do anything else. So JL... Should I try my 2022 Raptor on a Tundra TRD Pro? I like the fact that the Raptor is already set up for, to go off-road with the active shocks and 35-inch tires, but enjoy the reliability of my 4Runner have always. So I can't really comment on the Raptor because that's not my, my area of expertise, but the 4Runner is really good. You know, the, the TRD Pro, we have not gotten the 22 TRD Pro yet, but the previous one, the 21s and below, they are really good. They're already set up for off-road, actually, so you shouldn't have issues with them. Bud Hampton NH, 2008 Lexus ES350, 50,000 miles. What fluid maintenance should be done? It was my grandmother's car in Florida, coolant, transmission fluid. So at this age, I would definitely replace the transmission fluid. It's never been done. Coolant as well. Uh, if the spark plugs were never done, I would at least take them off and put them back in or just replace them. That's past past 10 years here. Otherwise, you know, just do a full inspection on the car. Make sure brakes, tires, if they're old, replace them, and you should be all set. Dirty Dog the Cold own a 2019 Lexus ES Hybrid. I don't really keep up with the scheduled maintenance, 5,000 mile interval maintenance, sorry, and just change the oil to keep an eye on the coolant. Is that good? Car has 65,000 miles. I would definitely encourage you to do the 5,000 mile, six month oil changes. The coolant, it's a little too early for that. Uh, sorry, uh, take that back. You said 65,000 miles, as I said, 5,000 miles. At 65,000 miles, I would replace the coolant. That's up to you if you don't want to do it or not, but I would replace it. So HD 2010 Prius 1.8. Why would there be raw any freeze in the intake? It's not cloudy, like mixed with oil from PCV. Could there be a crack in the throttle body warming circuit? It could be. This is something you're going to want to... Uh, look into because if if you're seeing actual coolant we could have some issues here cracks and whatnot but you're just if you're just seeing a cloudiness that could be just moisture just make sure it's it's moisture and not uh, sorry make sure it's not moisture that it's actual coolant there before you make anything because it could be just moisture mixing with that oil joe otto Thank you so much for the new shop. Folks, we'll talk about the shop toward the end of the live stream. How are you enjoying your new Camry? Any issues? Well, the new Camry has almost 3,000 miles. That's a milestone. Usually, I put a lot of miles on my cars, but lately, I've been getting the cars to do the reviews on, the loans, so haven't been driving it a lot, but it's almost 3,000 miles. I don't have any issues to report. I really love the car. Every time I drive it, I'm like, this is really nice. I mean, it's a car that gets really good gas mileage. And when I bought it, gas mileage was high on the list, but especially now because things are uh, not great with gas mileage lately. You know, fuel is really expensive and that was a really big plus. My other car is my Mercedes is really not a car you want to drive every day. And especially how it, uh, <clears throat> it's not great on gas or anything else, just the ride. 
then that might be actually uh, going away soon. So, Miles Glide, congratulations on the shop. Thank you very much, sir. I have a 2003 Corolla with a 3ZZFE engine, which I want to do a coolant replacement. What is the best way to empty the most coolant without removing anything but hoses? Actually, at the bottom of the radiator, uh, Miles Glide, I actually know you. You're, I think, uh, Israel, if I remember. I'm trying to remember here. I try to remember my viewers. Uh, if this is the same as the U.S. market, there is a drain on the radiator that will be on the driver's side of the radiator, you know, the left side. You're going to open that, let the coolant drain, make sure the, the radiator cap is off, and that will be really the most coolant you're going to get out of these. Another question from Miles Clyde. Where... Where I live, the original coolant is three times more expensive than the name brand aftermarket and needing 6.5 liters, which aftermarket brand would you recommend the best alternative? Honestly, the brands will be different from the U.S. and Israel. If you are in Israel, I'm trying to remember off memory. Uh, I would say the coolant, you're not replacing it every other day. I would say it would be worth it to splurge and buy the original coolant. But. If you're going aftermarket, make sure it's something compatible. If you have no choice, make sure it's something compatible specifically with Toyota, not something generic, just says Asian brands. Just make sure it says Toyota in the compatibility list. So Brian Z, have to drive a new Venza from a dealer home about 400 highway miles. Any recommendations for motor braking? Just take it easy on the drive. Try to avoid excessive speed. You know, you're doing 80 miles an hour and you jab into the car to overtake somebody. Try to avoid that. When you're going on ramp, try to avoid very hard acceleration. On the hybrids, they're a little bit easier to take it easy because uh, you're not solely relying on that engine. You're always also using the hybrid system, which is cool. But you know, just generally take it easy. Try to avoid high speed and you should have no issues. And congratulations in advance. That Venza is a really nice car. Wilson, is it okay to run a can of seafoam valve cleaner through the throttle body 2020 ES hybrid 25,000 miles? So whenever you want to run seafoam, there's nothing wrong with seafoam. It does work. But be careful because you're, you're putting this live liquid through the intake. You could easily lug like hydro lock the engine and if you go too much so small amounts as soon as as soon as you start feeling the engine run a little rough back off let it smooth out then start again because you don't want to put too much that's the key here bob 2003 corolla how do i keep field mice out of the fresh air ventilation so you want to close it and the biggest thing is you want to find the source why are the mice coming into your area if you're parking outside you have no choice but if you're parking in a garage you want to find how are they coming in are they is there food in the garage something that's attracting them in there are certain remedies like certain essential oils whatnot that you can put under the hood that actually deters them it's the smell that deters them i i, I drew a blank on the name of the one that really works but if i remember it i'll say it all of a sudden in the live stream but uh uh, that's really prevention is the biggest thing. You want to keep them out of the area where your car is. Or if it's outside, you want to do certain things to deter them. Unfortunately, they might still be there and go to the next car over. But at least, you know, if everybody does their part, they actually might leave that area. So Sam Cox, 2018 Tacoma 3.5 manual, 261,000 miles. Since around 230,000 miles, been getting PO420, PO430, slowly getting worse, won't stay cleared now, replacing all exhaust gaskets, replace all four O2 sensors, cats worn out, definitely cats are worn out. The only thing I would look into is, do you have any other codes? Do you have any rich running? Is there spark plugs were replaced in time? Stuff like that. Just make sure the engine is not wiping out these cats, but it could be just for miles and things are normal. So if that's the case, Go ahead and replace the cats, and you should have no issues. So, another question. TXC500, when we picked up our 2022 Forerunner, I noticed all the tires were inflated to 55 PSI. Service advisor said this is normal, and they all come in that way. Why would Toyota do that? So, I'm going to say this. If they handed you the car as in the delivery with 55 PSI, they did not do their job. Because yes, 
majority of the cars that come new, they'll come at 55 PSI. And the reason for that is they don't want the tires to have flat spots from, from transportation. You know, this car is going to come out of the factory, sit in the lot, and then it's going to get on a carrier, whichever way on the forerunner is going to come by ship. It's going to sit for a week, two, three, you know, it depends. They don't want the new tires to develop flat spots. And now we have vibration, but if you inflate the tires to 55, it's not okay if you drive on it like that, but you're not driving it. You're just storing it for transport. So they all come like that, or majority of them come like that, except they're like, I'm in Illinois, in Chicago area. The cars that come from Kentucky, and they're not going to sit. They actually come with normal pressure in them because they're not even going to sit. They're going to come out of the factory, get on a get on a uh, car transport. Three, four hours later, they're at the dealership. So it's not really worth it. But that is normal unless... If they delivered you the car and you took it home and find out that it has uh, 55 PSI, they did not do their job, and that's not good. They should deflate them before delivery so you would have the car with normal pressure. 55 PSI is very dangerous to drive on. For storage, is okay, but to drive on, it's no good. JSZ 13 Venza notice brake fluid is two inches below max. Should I top it off with old fluid? Should I top off the old fluid, new fluid, or have the dealer change it? If top off, what should I use? Asking since I'm not sure how all this works. Folks, the biggest mistake about brake fluid is to top it off. Believe it or not. Unless your brake fluid drops below uh, minimum, you do not want to top it off because as brakes wear, your, your brake fluid level is going to come down. When all your brakes wear out, like the fronts are a zero millimeter, the backs are a zero millimeter, you're going to be right at the minimum line. But as soon as you replace the brakes and compress that piston back, the level will come back to max. But if you top it off, now it's going to overflow. So don't top it off unless it's below minimum. And if it's below minimum, you have a leak that you need to investigate. It's going somewhere at that point. But I wouldn't top it off. Check your brakes. If, if the brakes need replacement, sometimes the fronts will be low, the rays are okay, you'll see it halfway. So when you see your brake fluid low, the first thing you want to do, check your brake wear. If they're worn, replace them first and you see the level will rise. But if it ever drops below minimum, you might have a leak. Okay, so David F, 2017 Forerunner. I've had it for almost five years and I can never get a good reading at all on my oil level dipstick. I know to warm it up, shut it off, wait five minutes to check any ideas. So sometimes these can be really hard to read, especially if you are really taking care of this car and the oil is very clean. They can be hard. The best way to do it is if you're having issues just seeing the level, get a piece of paper and put the dipstick on it, then compare it. You'll see the level. If you're having an issue actually like getting an accurate reading, it's like all smeared. Pull the dipstick slowly. Don't pull it very fast because sometimes that whips the oil, especially when it's hot, and then you won't get an accurate reading. The other thing is flip the dipstick and look on the other side. Sometimes if that happens, flip the dipstick, read the other side. So Lion Runner, for a little fun, can you show uh, sh can you show the base? Sold single coil Ibanez. Should I go cheapest music band? So I am. I have been been playing bass lately for a little bit because uh, things have been a little crazy with the uh, uh, with the shop opening and everything. But maybe one of these days we'll we'll hop over to the second channel and we'll make like kind of a random live stream and I'll show you a few things. Hubert L. 2004 Sienna heated seat on driver's side is not working. Switched light does illuminate. The fuses look okay. What else could be broken? So when it comes to heated seats, you want first to make sure that you are getting any activity. So they're underneath the Toyota heated seats. There's a little controller about this big. Usually those go out. What you could do is, th this is a little bit of a trial and error, swap the one from the passenger side if that works to the driver's side and verify that it works if it does you're good you know you just need that little controller which is underneath the seat replace it in your goods it's not very expensive but if it doesn't do it then you potentially have a problem with the grid you're going to want to check wiring and eventually take take the seat apart and start measuring um you, you have to start measuring resistance and whatnot to see which of the two heater elements there's one in the bottom of the seat and there's one in the back a good to, sorry, I'm going to say one more thing on that. A good tool to check for heated seat issues is a thermal imager. 
this is your as a DIY, you're not going to go buy an expensive thermal imager. But if you are in another industry and you actually have one, that's a really good tool to test them to see where if because sometimes you'll see it like it, you'll see the red and then it'll stop where the break is and you'll know that there is something going on there. Gregory, do you know if the fifth generation Toyota Prius will be released later this year or next year in 2023? So I don't like to speak about future products because you know unless it's parked in front of me i don't want to talk about it however this has been a very interesting year actually two years if you if you would supposedly this year should have been the year we would have seen the new prius with the fifth at least the announcement for it but nothing we have the tundra and the sequoia and even the alex 600 with a different hybrid system so I wonder if they're actually going to roll that. So basically have a motor in between the engine and transmission and a regular transmission. That could be something they might be exploring because we're already seeing it in other trucks. And you could see it on the bigger cars. I'm not saying this off of info. That's just a guess for my personal opinion. Time will tell. But so far, hush hush is the word on that. Jeffrey Bolick, some kids helped push my 2018 Camry out of the mud. I was pushing the car backwards on the rear door handle. Now the rear door handle will not open the door. Sometimes when you do that, the handle will come off. Like you, you push it so far that it actually disengages from the little. So it has a, the handle will have like a hook like this and it, it connects somewhere. If you push it, it could actually come off the hook. You're going to want to take the door panel apart and see what happens. Uh, but that's what I would do. And I think you have a second part. There we go. Joseph Bolick, does driving on highways, no towing gently increase the amount of time between oil changes? It does to a degree. Personally, I would still do it every 5,000 miles, six months, but that's up to you. Play it by ear on that one. Fred, diffs and transfer cases, how many miles between fluid changes? So the first replacement is 30,000 miles. Second replacement, you can go anywhere from uh, 30, 30 to 60,000 miles. So I should do it. But the first replacement is kind of important that you do it at 30,000 miles. JS, two questions submitted via Super Chat. Thanks for all you do. Thank you so much, JS. If I don't get to the questions toward the end, I'll have Mrs. Carcare not remind me here so we can get to your questions, sir. Thank you for your generosity. So, Sebi, between the LE and the XLE trim in the Corolla, which one would you choose recommend? So, when you're going with the Corolla, and this is a concern that I have with the little cars, they're getting up there in price. And, and if you're going to go at a, it depends how much you can get it for. If you're now looking at an XLE trim Corolla, yeah, it's nice. But if, if you can get for the same money, get a Camry SE, maybe even an LE. I mean, that's a better car. Of course, it's bigger. And it's the next step up. But if you're getting it for a good price, I don't usually recommend you buy the base model if you are able. Now, if money is tight and this is within your budget, you can't really go higher, then get the base model. That's why they have base models when you're on a budget. But if you can stretch your budget a little bit, it's always nice to get a little bit of options. Don't get the decked out version because that'd be too much. But get something in between. The XLE is a good trim. It does, doesn't increase the price significantly, but still it all depends on price but just don't forget when you're shopping for a car always look at the next car up if you're shopping for a corolla look for a camry if you're shopping for a rav4 look for a highlander you don't want to end up paying the same price as the next step up just because you added a bunch of options yeah the options are nice but the next step up is also a lot nicer So, Landon Ashby, 2013 Sienna XLE all-wheel drive, 170,000 miles. I noticed lately I get creaking sound when I shift in and out of park. Is there something I should grease, have adjusted, or bushing replaced, or is normal? I don't want to say it's normal, but it I've seen this a lot with Toyotas. Moisture gets into that mechanism. You can take it apart and clean it up and put grease on every, all the contact points where the shifter moves. It'll quiet down. But guess what? year or two later we're back to square one and the same thing so the 
this is something they actually updated the shifters on some of these where they're a little bit better seal they have better better like seals inside of them to not have moisture and stuff getting them but honestly i wouldn't invest too much money in this if you're diying this take it apart clean it up put some grease in the contact points and you shouldn't have issues i would not go as much as buy a new shifter just for the noise because it's not gonna affect the operation Nintendo 64. I like Nintendo 64. How often do you have to change the manual transmission fluid? So on the first replacement, to replace it at 30,000 miles. After that, 30, 60,000 miles is a good interval. Another question. I got a collision in my 2020 Forerunner. Toyota replaced the sensor and harness on the front end, but... Now, every 20 miles, the front end collision sensor goes off and it kills my cruise control. So they probably did not properly adjust the collision sensor in the front, the radar sensor. You're going to want to have them double check the calibration and adjust it if needed. Sometimes if these sensors are not sitting properly. They will cause issues. So Arthur Alvarado. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate it. Could you give me your opinion on a 2018 Camry SE 8-speed automatic with 23,000 miles? So the 2018 Camrys are good. The only thing I worry about is the transmission. If you have a choice of going to an 18, uh, to, sorry, to a 19, it will be better. If you have, if you like this car, you have it. I know with the car shortage, we kind of have less options here. But if that's the case, make sure that transmission is shifting fine. Uh, make sure, especially when you put it in drive, it doesn't have like a harsh engagement. These had a few up software updates, and the very, very early ones, the ones that are made in 2017, they actually had some actual issues with the transmission. They did extend some warranties on it, but if you have a choice, make sure that this is either a later build, like basically a 2018 made in 2018, not made in 2017, or just make sure that transmission is shifting fine before we do anything here. So Dan Garcia, does anyone have experience with the first generation Venza? Are there any major concerns to look out for? The only major concern I would say is the four cylinder engine. People did the 10,000 mile oil changes. By the time you get to 90, 100,000 miles, the thing burns oil like it's going out of style and that's not good. The V6, however, it it is really good. They do have a few issues here and there, you know, leaks, suspension. The tires are a little expensive than 20-inch wheels. But otherwise, they are good They are good cars to buy if you can find one that is in good shape and has been taken care of by the previous owner. Bob Lies, I have an IS300 and using a device that goes into the OBD port for car insurance. Can this cause any problems with the computers? So the thing about these um, little readers or these little devices you plug in the OBD connector from insurance companies for the most part they're okay i have had actually a few that cause all kinds of gremlins with toyotas i'm not saying that i'm not not recommending them like don't use them but you're gonna know right away apparently and talking to the insurance company back and forth on this apparently there are a few that have issues and when you have ones with the issues you're going to want to call your insurance and have them send you another one. But if it you plugged it in, week passes, and there are no issues, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just continue using it. The only thing I will say is if you don't drive your car for a long time, they might add a little bit drainage to the battery. That's the only thing I will add. So if you're going to park your car for a month, two, three, unplug it. When you come back, plug it in, then start the car. Life is good. That's the only thing I would do. Doug Hanks, 2004 Forerunner, sometimes throws cylinder six misfires and sometimes low on radiator fluid, head gasket leak. Potentially a head gasket leak, yes. Uh, you do want, I'm, I'm assuming this is a V6. You do want to, I have a video where we looked at the Sequoia uh, head gasket where I put the camera and pressurized the system and you can see the leak. You're going to want to do the same thing. So look for that video, just search car care, not head gasket on YouTube and you'll find that video. Do the same thing. You're going to run a good inspection camera, go in the cylinder, pressurize it, see it, and you, you'll see it clear as day that it's unfortunately leaking. And at that point, you are going to need a new head gasket. Okay, so one bozo nine. 
Hey, MD, how's it going? I'm doing good. A little I'm tired. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but overall, I'm doing well. I have a friend that has a leaking ABS module. New one exceeds the value of the car. Is there a way to bypass it? Do you know of any kits available to do this? Unfortunately, I wouldn't know any kits that would bypass them like that, but if you do some ingenuity and with DIY ingenuity, you could. I mean, all you need to do is just connect the lines that go from the master to the lines that are going to the wheels. Not something I recommend a lot because it's, you know, you're taking a safety component of the car, but I can understand if it's either this or junk the car. So if, especially if you're DIYing this, it would be a good idea to just bypass the lines. Molly Z, the SE and XSE Corolla have the two liter dynamic force engine with both the report and direct. The 1.8, sorry, I think I think you were responding to somebody else. <clears throat> so we already, no, actually it's another question. Landon Ashby, 2013 Toyota CNX LE, 170,000 miles. Next big maintenance is spark plugs, all plug and bolts, nuts are really corroded bolts nuts platinum gasket anything else i should be replacing with this uh you're gonna want to put a throttle body gasket and if you want put a pcv valve as well this pcv valves in the front very easy a few bucks to buy the the valve and that would be it nintendo 64 i have a deposit for a corolla gr hatchback can't wait for that one that's congratulations i agree lion runner so, here's another one. Jason W., how, you, how do you fix the shutter in an 07 FJ Cruiser? Tried the flush, then tried loop guard red. It still shutters between 30 and 50 miles an hour. You do want to make sure that this is, an, in fact, indeed a torque converter shutter. If it is, a new torque converter. Honestly, uh, usually those start shuttering when you don't replace the fluid on time every 30, 60,000 miles. But it gets to a point where replacing the fluid will not fix the issue. So in that case, you're going to want to replace the actual torque converter to, to remedy this issue. It's past the point of repairing it by just replacing the fluid. Chris Spretz, how much is the estimate cost in dollar amount for a timing cover for a V6 RAV? And do they all have that problem for the V6 option? So it seems like with, when it comes, this is the engine that uh, we're talking about here is a 2G RFE. This engine seems to have somewhat of a problem with the front timing cover leak. It start, some of them go 300,000 miles and nothing. Some of them don't even make it to 10,000 and they're leaking. Really hard to put make rhyme or reason. As far as the estimate, I would have to look this one up. I don't know the labor rate right off the top of my head, but somewhere in the 15 to the 20 hour range. You know, hourly rate will vary anywhere from 100 all the way to $200 an hour. Plus, parts are not a lot, maybe figure 150, 100, 200 bucks, something like that. Uh, but labor is very intensive. Engine has to come out. And actually, the RAV4 is the hardest one to do and the highest one in the labor rate. RMS, I bought a 2021 Lexus NX300 Turbo, brand new in 2021. I changed my oil at Lexus every 5,000 miles instead of recommending 10,000 miles per the owner's manual. Are these turbos reliable in your opinion? So I think you are already on track to minimize, if not completely eliminate, turbo issues because you're doing your oil change every 5,000 miles. Problem with, with turbos, they heat up the oil too much and the biggest problem is and this is something i would recommend to you if you drive your car hard don't just shut it off by the way this is still an issue people think it is not it is still very very much an issue so you're gonna want to be keep that in mind you remember the turbo timers in the past that's not feasible today but when you drive like your turbo car very hard before you are going to shut it off, let it run for a few minutes. Let that oil cool down in the turbo because that's what it starts. Turbos have come a long way. They're a lot more reliable today than they were in the past. But still, put 10 years, 150,000 miles on them, and this is going to add up, and you're going to have issues. So a little bit of care for these cars goes a long way in long-term reliability. So the strategic show 
I replaced my secondary air pumps and valves with aftermarket power. I still get codes for bank one pump with both valves. You're going to want to go OEM parts on these. When it comes to secondary air injection, folks, don't go aftermarket parts. And there's something else about these secondary air injections. Some of them will have a driver. Usually, I mean, you did not list the model here, but some of them will have a driver. 2010 Sequoia definitely has a driver. I'm trying to remember here, it's either on the uh, driver's side, like right between where the uh, fuse block is and the master cylinder. You're going to see a little metal piece about this big. That's a driver. Sometimes that driver goes out when, and won't activate the pump anymore. So you, I, I am skeptical about these aftermarket parts, but I would try the driver first. And you're going to want a scan tool to active test and see what's happening, where the voltages are. You don't want to just keep throwing parts at it at this point. Doug Hanks, what are your thoughts on a new future Forerunner redesign? Honestly, I don't, I don't like to uh, talk about future products, but I will say this. Potentially, you're going to see a hybrid Forerunner, and I hope we do because that would make sense. And something similar to the Tundra. I don't think you're going to see a V6. I hope they don't go four-cylinder in the Forerunner. Maybe we'll see the same V6 from the Tacoma. Maybe we'll see the four-cylinder turbo, unfortunately. Maybe the two, new 2.4 turbo. But I hope they go hybrid route because then you have much better gas mileage because that's something with the Forerunner that's really not great. Forerunner owners will agree. We're family here. We can we can uh, talk. Nobody's watching. Uh, I hope they go hybrid route because it makes sense. Right Lane Hog, where are you? I am here. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Anything fixed? Did you get a Yeti mic? No, this is actually, uh, I don't want to, let me go through to the questions and I'll tell you about the new setup. Dylan, how you doing, sir? Good to see you here. So another question, is the RX300H worth paying the extra considering it uses premium fuel? Well, it depends. It's, yes, it is a basically a Highlander that is much nicer, but it's actually very nice. I almost got an RX, the new, the new RX to review, but unfortunately it was involved in an accident and couldn't get it. But I still want to review it because it is truly not just a fancy Highlander. It's a lot nicer and it's different. Let's put it this way. But of course, that niceness comes with a hefty price difference. So that's uh, really, wh whether it's worth paying extra or not is up to you and your budget, but they're both nice cars that and the highlander please make more videos about preparing your shop yes i will that's we have another one cooking but i'm going to give it a little bit of time to give more uh, you know progress i feel like the other video we didn't do a lot so you'll see this one with a lot more progress what do you jackie what do you think of the corolla gr actually i am trying to get one put it this way that's how much i like it i think it's a proper car i think they they really did a good job and they went all out and didn't borrow uh whole, the whole car from bmw so i like it i you know i i truly enjoy the fun cars from toyota and i wish they would do more and more so my part is i'll go buy one and enjoy for a few years and move on to hopefully the next interesting thing that comes out of the toyota land Matt V, 2006 Echo, randomly goes into open loop drive, especially while braking. AF sensor sometimes reads zero volts. What should I do? So randomly going into open loop, especially while braking, could be normal. That is just sometimes the fuel trims will go all over the place and the computer will realize you're coasting. It's just going to come out of closed loop a little bit, then come back. That is normal. But the AF sensor reading zero volts sometimes, that is not good. You're going to want to investigate, do you have a wiring problem? Is the sensor bad? Is there an exhaust leak where it loses all flow to it intermittently? You know, there are a few things. Andre, Andre Lou, sorry. Could, can you please comment on the RAV4 cable gate? <laughs> How the high voltage cable will rust out? Folks, I have had an incredible amount of questions about this. I will say this. 
I do not want to give you false information. There, this is something that's developing right now. I want to see. I'm actually trying to get a RAV4. I'm going to dissect into it a little bit. It can't be, you know, a loan from the dealership, a loan from Toyota, whatever. It needs to be a viewer car that would allow me to go into it and see. Can we make a solution that would really work? Because so far there's no really solution from Toyota. So just give me some time on this one. I'll come up with a video dedicated to this, but I need to have information, not just tell you, yep, this is a problem. Well, everybody knows it's a problem, but I need to come up with a solution or something you can do to prevent the issues. That's what I'm trying to get. But without that, I don't feel like a video will be really be useful. I don't like to make videos that are just reading the news or reading a TSP to you. David F, 2017 Forerunner. I've had it for almost five years. I can never get Okay, sorry, we did answer this one already. Folks, try not to post the question multiple times. Bud Hampton. And we also answered this one. So, another question. My 2002 Highlander V6 idles a little bit rough when the cooling is on. Is this normal? Have you done seen this before? That is normal for that V6. It, it's not rough, but it's like a, you feel a little bit of vibration. You feel especially in the seat and the steering wheel. That is normal for that V6. I wouldn't worry about it, honestly. I mean, that's just normal characteristic. So another question here from Chaplin's Park. Just got a hybrid certified, waiting on tenure to be a master for Toyota. Question about why some Prius, when opening the hood, you see oil all over the bay. Very good question. And congratulations on being hybrid certified. And you are going to be a, a fine master technician for Toyota. Just keep up the good work. But as far as Priuses, usually it's the owners. So some of the older Prius, especially like 2010 to 2014, they burn oil, especially 2010, 2011. People get, you know, they they get tired of adding oil, adding oil, adding oil. Most of them don't have a funnel. And you know how it is with the Prius. You have that engine cover. Me and you, we just pull that cover and add oil, not make a mess. Owners, they're afraid to pull the cover. They're trying. Some of them are not car people. They're just trying to get through their day. So they're pour oil and it'll splash all over the place. That's one scenario. Second scenario, they'll usually forget the oil cap to put it back and it'll make a giant mess and by the time they find out it's already the mess so that's why you always see and i agree every single 2010 and 11 not every single but majority of them there's just a giant mess of oil and the other thing is because you are constantly opening that oil cap open close open close and some people like to tighten the oil caps like they're lug nuts please don't do that uh they wear out the seal there's a little seal inside the the oil cap and then it starts oozing oil everywhere so that's the other one. All right. Let's see the next question. So Cameron Ring, what, what to do when you get a new Toyota that didn't install the body plugs on my new car, CHR? The first thing you want to make sure is, do you have body plugs? If you th see these unique holes, I've been showing you them to you in the videos. If you see that there's no plug or you worse, you have the plugs in the glove box, do take it back to the dealership. Um, I wouldn't take it back to the dealership yelling, screaming. Just have them make it right, and that's it. There's, that's as simple as that. Fortunately, some technicians still do not do that. And it's not right because then what are you doing in the time that you are allotted for the pre-delivery service? Matthew, any ideas on what might cause vibration only at low RPM, around 1,600 RPM on a 2015 2.5 all-wheel drive RAV4? So at low RPM, hmm, that is a, that is an interesting one. Honestly, it's going to be really hard for me to tell because this is not an idle vibration there's a lot of things you want to check you want to check your prop shaft your axles you know this is something you want to have on a lift put it in drive get it to that rpm and look you're going to see something vibrating it but it's between axles um, and the rear prop shaft that's really the cause of vibration something at a higher rpm so Why are, so Aram, this is a good question. And actually, I'll, this will sneak peek you into a video that's coming up. Why are Camry oil filters so small on the new 2.5, 
my 07 is much bigger. Just because we have a bigger filter doesn't mean it's better. That's that's the engineers when they design this engine, they're going to run all their tests and they're going to determine we need this much filter media to effectively filter this oil in this specific engine. And then they're likely, you know, Toyota, how they are, they're going to go, okay, we're going to go 25, 30% larger filter. And that's that. Depends on how the engine runs. Some engines, they have a lot of dead spots where debris collects and your, your oil will always have debris in it. Some don't. It just depends on the design of the engine. But don't go just by the size of the oil filter because that's not a good uh, measure. So Squirrel Cookies. I just bought a 2009 Lexus IS250 with 86,000 miles. My question is, should I change the transmission fluid? Considering the mileage the car have, I would replace the transmission fluid. You're not too far into the mileage there. Chris, what's the max size camper you would tow with a 4Runner? Go with your, depends which year it is. You do not want to tow something that weighs the camper. If it has a trailer, the trailer, the total capacity that exceeds your towing capacity on your specific model. You can just Google uh, whatever year your 4Runner is, towing capacity, and you'll find it. Johnny Walker, is it a good idea to change the fuel filter on my 2006 4Runner? Will that help with fuel efficiency? It will not, honestly, because <clears throat> it's fuel efficiency and fuel filter in the olden days, maybe because it'll start running lean and we have okay, but we don't have actual filters anymore because fuel lately has been clean. We don't really have that. You have that little. Um, strainer if you would in the fuel tank really doesn't get ever get clogged unless you know you've had sugar in the tank or something of that nature which is not normal another question daniel any uh, led headlights you recommend for 2013 highlander uh the leds i'll put that name this is i don't they don't even know who i am i know who they are i'm going to put that in the screen here that's the website vleds.com they're not you know sponsor or any of this stuff they're just i think they're a company that make really good good stuff so that's why i always recommend them i've used them a lot and uh i like them they do they they have good stuff and i like companies where they make good products let's see where we were at with the live stream let's take Sorry, folks. We're still trying to get the uh, get used to the new platform to make the live streams better. Here we go. Matthew, I've got a 2009 Prius with HID headlights. They are so dim. Any ideas to make them brighter? Option to upgrade higher wattage ballast, brighter bulbs, LED upgrade. Honestly, you can replace the bulbs, but if the if the housing is all foggy, you're going to need a new housing. And they're so ridiculously expensive to go OEM. If you're going to go bulbs, don't go OEM. They're very expensive. You can find much better options aftermarket. They're a lot cheaper. You can basically buy two bulbs that are Phillips for half the price of one bulb. But a better solution would be take out the whole headlight, Put a halogen headlight and put a custom, you know, try to find an aftermarket solution because the housing itself is just not very good. Um, if you if you you are happy with the lights and they're progressively getting dimmer, then potentially look at just replacing the bulbs and see how it goes. But they really don't have very good light, even the HID ones. That's just how they are. This is old school technology with HID because they don't have a reflector. So John. Hello from Arizona. Today we're having Arizona kind of weather here. It's 80 degrees in Chicago. You know, that's how we, what we say in Chicago. If you don't like the weather, wait 24 hours. It'll be the next season over. <laughs> 2012 Prius. Tire pressure light comes on and off. Check pressure. Any way to check individual TMS, TPMS sensors. So you're going to want to have a scan tool that is actually capable of reading the actual values of your uh, sensors. And then there is, if this capable scan tool is really capable, it's going to have another section in the data where it's going to tell you, uh, this is the threshold. This is what the computer 
will turn on the light if the pressure drops below this point. If these are set too high, you're going to have it flicker on and off. But here's what I would do. If your pressure is set at 32, set it at 35. See if it goes out. If it goes out, you're good. You have nothing to worry about. Because sometimes you're close to that, and if you raise it a little bit, you're out and you're good, and it wouldn't keep flickering back and forth. Roger S. Does a catalytic converter thief theft shield trap too much heat? It does not. I mean, a little bit, but when you're driving the car, you know, air is passing through perfectly fine. So I wouldn't um, say that it actually traps heat and it's a concern. This is a good question. How will you keep up with your training and knowledge of what sorts of problems are occurring on because congratulations on the new shop. So, folks, be, when you keep working on the same cars over and over, you're going to get the same thing. That's why my shop is going to be Toyota Lexus. This is not the products I know. And these are the products I continue to work on and get experience. And the as far as Toyota training, there is actually training for aftermarket shops. Nobody takes it because it's very, very expensive, which I intend to actually do. That's how I will have access to the same stuff at the dealership. That's how I, how I will have access to the Toyota scan tool, official Toyota scan tool, nothing bootleg or none of that. It's very expensive. It's actually ridiculous. But because I specialize, it makes sense for me to pay that exuberant amount and continue training just like I would at the dealership. Fresh off YAA. How you doing, Sean? I hope you're doing well. So opinions on the Toyota T100 going to, going to inherit a two, 1996 DLX with 294,000 miles from my grandma. Rust-free, all California miles. Hope to restore it to its original glory. These were actually really good trucks, honestly. But uh, we don't see them here anymore because they really fall apart with rust i mean they, they just disintegrate with rust they're gone there's nothing left so if you have it rust free you're already on a good track to not have issues you're gonna like that truck because they're old school and they're easy to work on and they're really good oliver which which gear oil can i use on a differential on a 2019 tacoma gl5 go with your favorite brand really there's nothing special about the differential fluid on it Negan, a 2006 Solara, does it have a belt or a timing chain? Bought one recently with 121,000 miles. Should I get it changed out? So if you have a V6, it's a timing belt. If you have a four-cylinder, it's a timing chain. Uh, awesome cars. Really good cars, especially if it's a V6. The four-cylinder is okay, but the V6 is really the highlight. Very smooth, very nice car. Handling-wise, a little bit all over the place, but those are really good cars but if you just want reliability and comfort these are really good thank you Hanny Georges on the on the congratulations yeah it's in the southwest suburbs of Chicago so Michael Marks 2010 Venza V6 all-wheel drive, 134,000 miles no service history changed the differential gear oil and came out black and gritty Ran it for a week, changed the gear oil again. Should I keep changing it until it looks clean? I would because, especially on those Benzas, for some reason they get the fluid really, really dirty very quick, especially on the first time. Subsequent times, not as much. This could be on the original fluid from 134,000 miles, hence why it looks like that. But uh, I wouldn't worry too much as long as you replace it once you're okay i wouldn't keep repeating it steven rap thank you so much steven um steven is actually a local viewer who i spoke with recently uh he has a very cool land cruiser which we are hoping when the shop opens maybe we can feature it on the channel just check it out it's a really special land cruiser Guko, how can I contact you so you can service my Lexus RX 330? I'm from Chicagoland. Goku, at the moment, I am fully booked until the shop opens, believe it or not, because I have a lot going on, and this is something we're going to talk about a little bit. But stay tuned when the shop opens. You know, we'll, you'll have a schedule. We'll have a scheduling system where you can come in and book an appointment. I will talk a little bit about the shop, folks, because a lot of you have asked about this. Uh, let's do leave that at the end of the live stream so we can get to as many questions as time allows. 
So CR1545, is 87 regular better than 87 with 10% ethanol for 2013 Lexus 300H? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you have access to uh, like straight gasoline without any ethanol, that is the best gas you'll get. Your gas mileage will go up. Your engine will be happier. Everything will be great. If you have no access like me, we don't have really access. We actually now have 15% ethanol, which please avoid at all times. Even if it's cheaper, it'll dip your gas mileage more. Folks, let's put it this way. And this is the best way I can explain it for you to remember. Alcohol burns and this is just a hypothetical number for you to remember if there's an actual exact alcohol burns you're going to need twice the amount of alcohol to get the same effect of gasoline so while it's a cleaner cleaner burn for the environment which is great but you're going to be it might be cheaper you're going to be consuming double the amount so it really you know you're not really gaining anything so other than protecting the environment which it does burn cleaner there's no benefit actually there's downsides to it so if you have access to non-ethanol gas go for it so another question here i have a i have forty thousand miles on my 2013 prius c dealer is recommending two stage fuel system service use top tier gas with regular oil changes and pg haven't changed i wouldn't honestly do it if, you, if you're driving this car um, frequently you're not putting really short trips on it, like, you know, a mile or two every day and nothing more, never driving on the highway, rarely driving on the highway, then potentially, otherwise, it's not worth it. Honestly, you're, you're not going to gain anything from it. Another question, DDK80, 2009 RAV4 with 90,000 miles with a 2.5. I have oil in two of the spark plug wells on threads and up into the insulator, but not all the way to the coil pack. Is this a sign of failed spark plug tube seals? Folks, this has been asked a lot, and a lot of people go to placing these spark plug tubes, and they spend a lot, and they're kind of a little bit on the difficult side to get them right without breaking the tabs underneath them. And then they find out that it leaks again. But it's going to take another 10 years to leak again like that, because what's leaking is the tube the spark plug tube is actually pressed into the. Let's explain this because a lot of people are falling for this one. The spark plug tube is pressed into the cylinder head. And when they've pressed it in the factory, they did not put any kind of sealer around it. It's just sitting there. So if you have enough oil sit there, it's eventually one the tiny, teeny drop is going to make it past. And you're going to see a little bit of oil. Add 10 years to that, you're going to have a little puddle of oil. But guess what? If you clean that puddle of oil and drive it for 10 years, then you're going to see the same puddle. But if you clean it and drive it for a year, you're not going to see anything. So going back to the spark plug tube seals, here's the spark plug tube. And I'm going to try to simulate that with this water bottle. Here's the spark plug tube. Your spark plug is in the middle. Your seal is sitting here. And your spark plug tube is sticking out from the seal. Oil does not jump up and into the spark plug tube. It doesn't do that because the seal is sitting underneath it. If it leaks, it's going to leak on the on top of the valve cover. And if you don't see oil around there, there is no reason to replace the seals. You can replace them, fine. But don't think that this is going to solve the issue. When you see oil on your spark plug tube on the modern engines, now we're not talking about old engines, newer stuff, clean it and let it go. Revisit it in a year to evaluate if we have an active big leak or it's just the normal potential drop here and there. Because I've seen so many people spend so much money on this for nothing. Be careful for this. Be careful with this. So, Rafael Emilio Garcia, 2017 Sienna Limited, the seller BMW of replaced the defective JBL audio system with a Panasonic. Two problems. So, Rafael, I don't see the rest of your question. If you found it, I'll have Mrs. Carcare not look if she find it later in the comments, so we'll get to it. So, Let's take one more question. Mark Morgan recommended brake pad, brake rotors and pads for a 2020 Tundra, which hauls a boat. So 
personally, I would go OEM. Your Tundras are going to chew up brakes no matter what you do to them. Some people put slotted and drilled and whatever rotors. They're all the same. It's just going to chew up brakes when you really load them up. That's just a limitation of the size of the rotor that you have. Another question is, and this actually comes from Mrs. Karkirna, Forza, Forza plays. Yeah. Why does the Toyota Fluid have different labels? So I would love if you would have told me which which fluid, because it's it's really hard. To, you know, some of them will have different labels for countries. If you're in the U.S., you know, they have U.S. regulations to go through. If you're, for example, in the U.K., you're going to have different regulations that you have to, to abide by for your labeling standards per area. That's why they might have different labels, but usually it's the same stuff in it. Made in the same factory. They just, oh, yeah, it's going for the U.S., let's put the U.S. sticker. It's going for the U.K., let's put the U.K. sticker. Let's see. Daniel Owes, fighting parasitic draw drain on my 2021 RAV4, only 7,600 miles, have needed jumps way too many times. They updated firmware as radio was, was shutting down, right? Worked la fine last winter. Any ideas? Did they update the DCM? You say they updated the firmware. Verify that they actually did the DCM. That's one thing. If it does not do it, and this is something that you're going to listen closely to this one, Car Karen and family. If you have a modern Toyota, this is something that we're discovering recently. If you have a modern Toyota that, when I say modern, like the latest generation um, audio system, like let's say 2019 and up RAV4, 2018 and up Camry, these newer systems. Uh, if you have issues with the radio, with batteries going down, and the DCM has been updated, though, that's very important. Or the radio just rebooting. As soon as you start it, show the Toyota logo, then it reboots. Show your Toyota logo, reboot. It just keeps doing that. Disconnect the battery for 30 minutes or more, actually preferably overnight. You start the car back up, you connect the battery, start it, and voila, everything works perfect. We've seen people spend a lot of money to replace radios, do this, do that. It's actually just that. First, it's unexplainable. That's why I don't want to make a specific video about it. But it is fixing these issues. So, Daniel, if you verify that your DCM has been updated to the latest version and is still doing that, disconnect the battery overnight and see if you have better results. I know it doesn't make sense, but just try it. This is from experience. Charles, I have a 2003 V8, 212,000 miles. Forerunner, and I think my cats might be bad because when I really get on the gas, I can smell something like rotten eggs. So if you just smell rotten eggs and you don't have codes, I wouldn't say that your cats are bad because that is, I know it sounds, um, it smells really bad and you think the cats are bad, but they're actually not bad. They're, that's how cats are. If you don't drive this car hard, they're going to collect debris. And when you really stomp on them, they're going to make that smell. That happens every single time. Uh, but if you have codes, that's a different story. If you have codes and you have a failed uh, catalytic converter, but if you just have the gas smell, yeah. But the one thing I will tell you about that forerunner of yours, they're notorious for exhaust manifolds to develop cracks and they start leaking. And maybe that's why you're smelling it inside the car more. Uh, Typical thing with these, you start, especially when it's cold, there's a clattering. Like you'll hear a clatter from the engine, then it goes away. There's actually the exhaust manifold. Lion Runner, thank you so much for your generosity for Mrs. Car Care Not Pay Race. That is awesome. Forza plays. Why does Europe Prius V have seven seats and the North American doesn't? Again, safety regulations. Um, I wish we had the seven seats. A lot of people actually are not aware of this. I recently found out about this. The Prius V in some parts of the world have seven seats instead of the regular five. Safety regulations, a lot of stuff, because the U.S. is really tough on, on crash testing and whatnot, and sometimes they'll require stuff that just wouldn't work. So they potentially designed the Prius V to have seven seats initially, and then they couldn't pass it or didn't get the result that they wanted, so they took them out for the U.S., but kept it for other markets. That's the only thing I can really think of. Uh, too bad, because seven seats in a Prius V, Really like that car. It's actually a really good car. 
Okay. Steven Rapp, what's your favorite part of building your new shop? We'll talk about that in a little bit. I'm loving everything, but it's very stressful. <laughs> so, David, thoughts on the latest 3G Tacoma? I have a new 2022 one with a six-speed manual transmission. Any thoughts on a Pontiac Vibe? I have a 2006 Pontiac Vibe. This is my other car. So, the 2022 Tacoma especially with the six-speed manual transmission, really good. They did have some issues in 16 and 17, but at 22, things are really good. And they have been for a little bit of time here, for a few years. The 2006 Pontiac Vibe is really good, and I'm saying this about a Pontiac. For those who are not aware, a 2006 Pontiac Vibe is basically a 2006 Toyota Matrix. Very good car, and sometimes their prices drop really low because people, oh, we don't want to buy this old Pontiac junk. It's actually a really good car. And if you find one underpriced and have you know in good shape, they're they're one of the best cars, old cars you can buy that are really good. Brian Z have to drive new. Sorry, we already did this one. Tim Barden, 2019 Forerunner Limited, brakes violently lock up suddenly if I switch from accelerator to brake pedal too fast. This is crazy. My last generation forerunner didn't do this can i do anything unfortunately no and and i know exactly what you're talking about because we actually had a few uh owners that that didn't like this the thing about these is when they detect that you're pressing the brake pedal kind of a, in a panic situation they're actually gonna the computer will immediately increase the braking force to full to help you make a panic stop but it's actually very annoying in real life because you know depends on how you drive you know some people i am one of those people i'm not saying you are i'm the kind that accelerate and stop and you just because i am very busy and i have a lot of things going on at the same time so i do tend to do that sometimes and on the forerunner i remember it just nose dives and it just goes really annoying unfortunately that is their idea of helping to make things better but yeah there is not really anything you can do about that so, Linda M., how can I find where the leak is causes in the cargo area of my 2008 Highlander to get soaked every time it rains? So, you have a few things on your 2008 Highlander. First is the seal around the big door. Second is the seal around the little glass in the back. These are the first two places. The other places are license plate bolts. And then the other place is that... that uh, panel, or they call it garnish in Toyota Land world, uh, where it says Highlander, that big garnish piece where it has a door handle underneath it, that also has a seal. That is probably the last on my list, but you know, if this is going to take you're going to want to take the inside of the car apart and try to see traces where the water is coming from. The way we do it at a dealership land, or any mechanic would do this, this kind of diagnosis, Linda, you're going to take the interior panels off and you're going to run a hose with the door closed. You're going to have the mechanic sit in the back, water running, and we're going to see where the water is coming from. It's usually a seal, something. If this car had accident damage in the past, that could be. You know, the reason why we have some leaks here if things are not sitting correctly. But if it didn't have any accidents, that's good. That means it's going to be a little seal, or rubber garment, or something simple. Nothing crazy or expensive. Ke Kenneth Patterson, 2009 Toyota Highlander that accumulates water on the driver's side after a rain. I found on line two, remove the A-pillar and run the tube. One thing about this. Uh, 2009 Highlander. By the way, this applies to you, Linda, as well. If you're sure it's just the back, don't worry about this. But let's hear me out. Something about the 2008 to 2013 Highlander. And I've done this in a video. We talked about, uh, about this. I don't know if you've seen it or not. The sunroof drain comes down, and it doesn't go outside the body. It comes down and stops, and then there's like a little funnel in the body that take notorious to clog. People clean the drain, and they don't clean that. You did nothing. It's just going to collect and fill the car. So you want to look at that. Um, I think the video that we I actually showed you this, we did an inspection camera, was when we looked at that one Highlander that the dealership Two dealerships, two shops didn't fix it, and I was really upset at what they did. They had a headlight problem, which actually we're um, we're getting that car in soon. As soon as we get parts, I'm still waiting. I'm, I'm going to film that repair. But yeah, you do want to do clean that funnel. 
Omar Daoud, what is the recommended transmission fluid for 2010 Toyota Corolla 1.8 manual transmission? I generally recommend that you use a uh, GL4 for manual transmission. Some of them will say GL5, and that's okay in those cases, but I still would use GL4. Some models will say GL4 or GL5. Use the GL4 from experience, I'm speaking here. Michael, what tires do you recommend for the Prius Prime? Well, here's how I look at it for the Prius Prime. If you like the mileage, stick with Eco tires. If you really think that the car doesn't handle well and slides all over the place, go with non-Eco tires, but just know that your mileage will drop slightly. Not something significant, but a little bit. Tires are kind of like shoes. You, I can't recommend what I would put in my cars because that suits my needs and my taste. Just know that tires create make a significant change on how the car drives. If you have kind of more sportier tires, it's going to handle better, but it's all of a sudden going to be harsh, louder. If you have more on the cushier uh, tires, like the comfortable Michelins and whatnot, they're going to be on the softer side. You know, the ride is soft, but now the car doesn't handle as sharp. That's that's the compromise here. So, fortunately, I can't make a specific recommendation, but I will just tell you about the Eco Tire stuff. Tango have a 2015 Avalon, but used and no owner's manual. What are the two buttons on the left side of the glove box? Only see them when the door is down. I am going to go off memory here. One of them, if I'm remembering correctly, one of them is going to be for your TPMS reset, and the other one potentially is for your trunk uh, override. So you can't open the trunk with a button when you override it. It's used for valet mode. But uh, I'm going off memory here. Usually that's the buttons that Toyota have put there, the two buttons. I am looking at another question, and I'm looking to buy a 2011 Avalon in perfect condition with 115,000 miles. Any problem areas I should look into? So you're going to check it for leaks. We just talked about the 2G RFE earlier in the live stream. Uh, you do want to make sure you have no oil leaks on the front timing cover. Less common on these, but still, it's, where it's easy enough to check where I would check it. The other thing is rack and pinions. They're notorious on these to leak. Just check if they're, it's not the end of the roll if it's leaking, but you could be uh, negotiating the price there a little bit, even though it's hard these days. But the rack and pinion or the power steering system in general, make sure it doesn't have any leaks. Otherwise, everything else in this car is a really good car. Maintenance, you know, you said pristine. So uh, I'm, I'm anticipating good maintenance. So P Low, talk about. ADAS. So I did have a full series on um, ADAS. Well, ADAS is like a, a general term in the industry, but I talked about Toyota Safety Sense. It's a full series. I explain how things work from the background and everything. You might want to check that one out. Just write Car Care Not Safety Sense, and you'll see that series. L. Freddy, how you doing, sir? Thank you for joining us. And Mrs. Car Care Not, hello. I'm late, but happy to be here. She has a lot going on today. We'll we'll give you a break this time. <laughs> uh, let's see. CR1545. Does 87 octane ethanol blend harm a Lexus hybrid? Is it cheaper? But I am scared to use it because I have been putting regular, but it's four twenty-four a gallon, and the other one is one dollar cheaper. Folks, do not use the ethanol blend, especially if it's 15%. I understand things are expensive. If you're really in a crunch, every other fuel tank, go back to the regular stuff. It's just not, you, you're going to, it It absolutely breaks my heart that people will find out the hard way, if you would. Okay, let's talk about this because this is actually something that's going on. And, and somebody has asked me to make a video about it. I don't like to get into this. There's a little bit of political stuff with that, but let's talk about it for your benefit. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're going to get the 15% ethanol gasoline. It's cheaper. But guess what? Your gas mileage will tank. So we're back to square one. You're buying cheaper gas, but you're consuming more of it in a shorter, in the same period of time. So and there is a disbenefit to your car long term. Try it once and you'll see what I'm talking about. The more ethanol you have in gasoline, the more quicker it'll go away. 
because it's not meant for fuel economy. It's not meant for economy at all. It's meant for emissions. And that's the only thing that they're good at. So, folks, we're going to take one last question and we'll talk about the shop stuff. So, do you recommend changing the transmission filter in my 2010 Camry or can I do a drain and fill? If your fluid is replaced on time, 60,000 miles, six years, you actually never have to replace the filter because there's no contamination enough to clog that filter in Toyota transmissions. But if you haven't been doing that, then I would consider replacing the filter, but no later than 100,000 miles. That, I hope, would help you. Folks, I'm going to go to the end of the live stream. So we are live on the chat here and we can talk so I can see what, what you guys are thinking here. So we're going to talk a little bit about the shop. So here is what's going on with the shop, folks. It's been, it's been, uh, it's been a long journey. I am extremely, extremely tired because, you know, I'm, I'm going to the dealership. And for some of you have asked, am I still a dealership? I am still at the dealership. Um, you know, I still got bills to pay. I can't be spending in the shop and here and there and not working. That doesn't work in my world. But I'm working at a dealership, dealing with the shop stuff, filming videos. It's been a little bit of a, of a tough time here. But we're chucking along with the shop. It is going to be shop open for business for... You know, anybody, you, you all can come in if you want. Just don't come in the same day. That me and Mrs. Karkin might not be able to handle that because you guys are awesome. Um, the plumbing is in. I'll give you the update. Plumbing is in. We're actually ahead of schedule, which is very good. That kind of takes my stress away. But uh, things are going along really, really well with the shop. I'm going to shoot the video in a little bit here in a few days. But expected to come up maybe in a week or two just i just want to actually show you big progress here we have a lot planned for the shop i can't wait i hope you guys are as excited as i am because this has been uh, quite an undertaking it is very difficult um if you own your business you already know what i'm talking about um, if you work in automotive world you know how difficult this is because the regulations on how regulated the automotive world is it's it's a lot and it's too much but i still work at a dealership and when i don't work at a dealership anymore after that when i dedicate to the shop i am spending a small fortune to continue with the toyota training you know i don't want to be behind on training basically the plan in my head is i want to continue to keep my all my certifications with toyota you know i'm going into business for everything but Whatever happens, I'm still a Toyota technician with all my experience, so I can go right back. Life's good. So I do want to continue with the training. And by the way, you can go to tech here. I'll put this website so you can go and see. So I will put this website on the screen. Techinfo.toyota.com. If you want Toyota training, this is where you start. It's very expensive, and you're going to have to kind of figure out how to navigate the system to get to the actual training part. But it is available to the public for the most part. The in-person class, we're still figuring that out. But most when you get to a certain cer certification level, there is no longer in-person classes. It's just all online training, and that's it, and actual experience. So the shop is going to be only Toyota, Lexus, and Scion. Somebody has asked if uh, I will take other makes and models. I will, but it will not be the priority because it's not something I specialize in if I'm helping somebody that I already know. So just wanted to let you guys know on that. I am very tired. It's been, it's been quite a scary journey here to uh, get things going, but we're committed the other thing is the live stream how do you guys like it is it much better i am really liking this new system that we got i do have to give credit where credit is due zach from yaa was actually the one that really helped me establish this new system and get things going so huge shout out to zach from yaa if you guys don't know yaa they're basically uh, it's very similar to my channel. Their heart is in the right place, but not on the mechanic and repair side. They're more on the um, sales and how to deal, to buy a car and whatnot. 
their hearts in the right place are good people. I really appreciate them. Folks, thank you so much for watching the live stream. I really appreciate it. And from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for all your love and support as we go through this interesting journey of figuring out how to open our own business. Me, Mrs. Car Care, and I, you guys have been really loving and supporting, and your advice was awesome. I know how to fix cars. I know my Toyotas, and I always give you my advice. But a lot of you are professionals in your perspective fields, and I could really use your help when you can. So when you see the videos for the shop, you have knowledge in that perspective area, please chime in because this really helps us make the right choices here because we have a lot of stuff that we have no clue what we're doing <laughs> here so it really helps guys from from my family to yours enjoy your weekend thank you so much for joining the live stream we're going to see you next saturday at 7 p.m and until then may the lord bless you and keep you and you guys have yourself a wonderful day